I hoped I still had the Indian sign on, Johnny. Sure, I could draw as fast as ever, but I couldn't squeeze the trigger. But Pop had been killed, and I had a feeling Johnny had done it. I had to find out. Now. That's him now. Who killed Dan Mears? Why, ask me. I guess he couldn't find his gun. He didn't have a chance to find it. He was shot in the back. Where were you? I was five miles out, working as a guide for the Acme mine. And if you're lying to me... You don't think I'd lie to you, do you, Marshal? I wouldn't advise it. Unless you're thinking that bullet I took slowed my draw. Has it? There's a sure way to find out. Uh-uh. I've reformed. But my friend here hasn't. His name's Blake from Tombstone. And he don't like Marshal. Now I've lived long enough for us to get acquainted. You've been meeting the wrong kind of marshals. I don't think I have. If you're in Silver City after sundown, Ratface, I'll throw you in jail. This is Stormdog. And today, I want to go way back to when movies didn't even have color and war heroes became movie stars. Up through at least the 60s, this was quite normal, most likely due to how many men served because of the draft in various countries. There was a day when your favorite action star might have seen action in wartime, your favorite author, or even your president. Christopher Lee was one of the last of this special type of star. Nowadays, we're lucky to even see an action star that got their start in some type of martial arts. Oliver Grunier may be a special exception, but his career sadly did not reach the heights it should have. If you know of any other modern exceptions, let me know. Our movie today, The Duel at Silver Creek, has one of these real-life action stars that were much more prevalent back then. The movie came out in 1952, and the top billed star was Audie Murphy. Unfortunately, we've reached the days when the average person has no clue who Audie Murphy is. He served in the American Army during World War II in the European theater. He became one of the most decorated combat soldiers of the time. His early life was hard in northeastern Texas, but that was not all that infrequent back then. His father drifted in and out of the family's life for years before finally deserting them. Audie had to drop out of school at fifth grade to begin picking cotton for a dollar a day to help the family. He also became skilled with a rifle to supply his family with small game to help feed them. They say he was a loner and had an explosive temper. His mother died of pneumonia and endocarditis when he was 16 in 1941. His youngest siblings were put in an orphanage. After the war, he was able to buy a house for his older sister and her husband to briefly bring all the kids back together in the same house. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, he tried to enlist in the Army, the Navy, and the Marine Corps, but all turned him down for being underage and underweight. He got his sister to give a false affidavit, changing his birth date to make him appear older, and was finally able to join the Army. He joined the Army in June of 1942. He ended up seeing combat in the Allied invasion of Sicily, the Battle of Anzio, the liberation of Rome, and the invasion of southern France. During this, he was hospitalized for various times for illnesses including malaria, gangrene from gunshot wounds, besides the wounds in his hips and both legs, but always found a way to return to service. By the time we reached the incident that made him famous, he had killed over 20 enemy combatants and captured several. On the day that gained him the Medal of Honor, his company was supporting some tanks when the Nazis scored a direct hit on an M10 tank destroyer, setting it on fire and causing the crew to abandon it. His men were now pinned down by sustained fire. Murphy ordered his men to retreat to the safety of some woods as he remained alone at his post. He returned fire with his M1 carbine and called in artillery fire from his field radio. Murphy then mounted the abandoned, still-burning tank and began firing its 50 caliber machine gun at the advancing Nazis. A squad of them tried crawling through a ditch toward him and he was able to kill them all. For an hour, he held this position on the burning tank, holding back Nazi soldiers and tanks, killing or wounding at least 50 Nazis. He sustained another leg wound during this, but only stopped when he ran out of ammunition. 
He rejoined his men in the forest and led them back to the position to finish repelling the Nazis, ignoring his wound. He stayed with them and had his wounds treated there. After the war, James Cagney read an article about him and recruited him for his film company. His film career began in 1948 and over the course of the next 20 years, he released over 40 movies. While Cagney did provide him training in acting, voice, and dance, a disagreement ended their contract with Murphy never making a movie for him. Other Hollywood connections began getting in bit parts until his first lead role with 1949's Bad Boy. He began his real film career at Universal Studios. His most famous movie to Hell and Back, an adaption of his autobiography would not be made until 1955. He was reluctant to play himself in the movie but eventually agreed. He ended up mostly playing in westerns, one of the hottest genres at the time. In his personal life, he bred quarter horses. Unfortunately, bad investments and gambling brought him into financial difficulties. Despite this, he refused to be in alcohol and cigarette ads as he felt it was a bad example. His PTSD from the war led to him find relief using sleeping pills that unfortunately became addictive. His life was cut short in 1971 with a plane crash in Virginia. Pilot was not sufficiently trained with his instruments and visibility was zero during a rainstorm. They crashed into the side of a mountain killing all five occupants. He was almost 46. He is now interred at Arlington and you can see his grave there. It's very easy to find even when the tour guide only wants to tell you which president's wife planted the trees and ignore all the stories of valor and service of the people buried there. There are many great examples of Murphy films, especially westerns. This isn't even necessarily the best. If you could only see one of his films, I recommend the one based on his life to Hell and Back. This is still a very entertaining movie and one that made me immediately nostalgic for a childhood when I watched almost solely black and white westerns. The story immediately felt like I was sitting down for another episode of The Lone Ranger, but the plot developed in ways which surprised me. A gang of claim jumpers are going around forcing people to sign over their claims and then killing them. And this is where we first meet Murphy's character, the Silver Kid. With a name like that, I'm disappointed we never got a sequel. He's a good poker player and a better shot. His father is murdered by the claim jumpers, giving him motivation for the plot. We also have a local sheriff attempting to stop the gang. Early on, our sheriff is wounded. The nerves controlling his trigger finger are destroyed, leaving him useless in a quick draw. He must now hide this fact from an enemy growing ever more aggressive. The sheriff and the silver kid eventually join forces after initially being tricked into going against each other. The sheriff is wise and canny enough to see the integrity and value in the Silver Kid and make him his deputy. Still, he hides his weakness from him and everyone else. That's not very good for a marshal, is it? I could do better with my left foot. Sometimes it feels like it doesn't even belong to me. Add in a love triangle with the shopkeeper's daughter having eyes for the sheriff, despite his disinterest, and the silver kid having eyes for her. Then the villain's partner shows up in town to lose the sheriff, but pretend to be an ally, despite being a femme fatale, and the sheriff only having eyes for her. I guess that would make it more like a love quadrangle. The characters build nicely, having their own reasons and feelings, and increase investment. Everything works out nicely in the end, at least for the good guys. 
The femme fatale tries to play that she was under duress and has always been in love with the sheriff, but I feel she deserves her end. She hasn't shown any remorse before this, leading me to think it's just another ruse to get the sheriff to do his thinking with the wrong physiological system. There are some solid gunfights with a lot of energy, and we see Murphy jump onto horses and smash through windows in classic fashion. It's an entertaining movie and moves along well. There's even a very early Lee Marvin as one of the bad guys, and it might surprise you how full his face looks and how much hair he has. The Sheriff is played by Stephen McNally, and he is the main character, despite this being an Audie Murphy vehicle. He has way more of the screen time and carries much of the plot. He does really well with it, and I love how Murphy's character supports him. There's a great back and forth between the two, where they end up supporting each other's weaknesses. They make a great duo. McNally was originally an attorney, but switched to being an actor in the late 30s. He plays a lot of hard-edged noir characters or thugs and villains. And that noir influence comes across in the movie here, and I love it. He had a part in Winchester 73, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, and over a hundred other big and small screen credits. For the shopkeeper's daughter, we have Susan Cabot, and this was the first of three movies she did with Audie Murphy, including Gunsmoke and Ride Clear of Diablo. She was also in Machine Gun Kelly with Charles Bronson, and is memorable in Son of Ali Baba and Flame of Araby. For better or worse, her final films were all Roger Corman movies. Dim the lights, lock the door, and cuddle up with an old friend. Join director Roger Corman as he hosts American Movie Classics Monster Fest. Throughout the 60s and 70s, she did a few off-Broadway plays and some small TV bits, but mostly dropped out of the public eye. By the 80s, she was suffering from severe mental illness. In 1986, her son, Timothy Scott Roman, living with her, was awakened by her screaming and attacking him. He testified she attacked with a barbell and scalpel. Roman grabbed the bar from her and hit her repeatedly in the head, leading to her death. Panicking, he hid the evidence and told the police a man in a ninja mask had done it. He was charged with second-degree murder, but his attorney defended him, saying it was due to drugs he took to treat his dwarfism and pituitary gland problems. The judge ended up charging him with involuntary manslaughter. The femme fatale is played by Faith Domergue. Right after her high school graduation, she was disfigured in a car crash as she flew through the windshield. She spent 18 months undergoing plastic surgery. Later, she was scouted by Warner Brothers and signed to a contract. They changed her name to Faith Dorn. She met Howard Hughes at a party and he bought out her contract and bought her parents a house. They, to no one's surprise, became romantically involved. This lasted until his indiscretions with Lana Turner, Ava Gardner, and Rita Hayworth broke up the relationship, among many other problems. He reclaimed the name Domergue near the end of their time together. When she appeared in this movie, she was freelancing to different studios. She was in This Island Earth, along with many other classic sci-fis. One of the bad guys, Johnny Sombrero, is played by Eugene Iglesias. I was very pleasant surprised to find out that the Hispanic character was played by a guy from the island of Puerto Rico. This was actually decently progressive for its time, and I'm happy to see he had a good career, especially on the small screen. Their director here is Don Siegel, and this is the first Western he ever did. He later did a large amount of Clint Eastwood's classics, including Escape from Alcatraz, Dirty Harry, Two Mules for Sister Sarah, among others. He did one of John Wayne's final films, The Shootist, did crime classic Charlie Vark, hard-boiled classic The Killers, and war classic Hell is for Heroes. You can begin to see the framework of his career and later greats here. The movie is an entertaining, well-scripted western that we used to see a lot more of. It's classic stuff and warms a spot in my heart. 
I felt this one had more going on plot-wise than a lot of this era's westerns and almost had a noir subtone. There's some really good players here and the film complements them. Unfortunately, I couldn't find it on any streaming services in the US at the time of writing. It's definitely the kind of thing I usually find on Tubi hidden classics. If you like a classic western or are interested by the backstory of some of these actors, check this one out. Until next time, this is Stormdog.